Breaking Bread By six o'clock in the morning, little David was dressed and ready to leave home for kindergarten. Mother handed over his backpack stuffed with textbooks, paper, pencils, and, most importantly, breakfast. Breakfast was a delicious, chewy chunk of bread. Kindergarten started at seven o'clock. After a few lessons, it finally was time for breakfast. David eagerly pulled the bread from his backpack. He was hungry. As he prepared to eat, a little boy sitting beside him spoke up. Could you share with me? he asked. David saw that the boy didn't have any bread. His mother hadn't packed a breakfast for him. David tore a piece off the bread. Here you are, he said. As the boy accepted the bread, another boy came over. Could you share with me? he asked. David saw that this boy also didn't have any bread. His mother also hadn't packed him a breakfast. David tore off another piece of bread. Here you are, he said. Then a third boy came over. David guessed right away what he wanted. He saw that the boy didn't have any breakfast and must be hungry. Sure enough, the boy had a question. Could you share with me? he asked. David didn't have much bread left. He wondered what to do. Then he remembered a Bible story. In the story, God's prophet Elijah was hungry, and he went to a poor mother for help. He asked the mother, could you share with me? However, there was a famine in the land, and the mother only had enough flour and oil to bake one last loaf of bread. She had planned to eat the bread with her son, but she shared it with Elijah. God rewarded her with a miracle. God provided an unending supply of flour and oil, and the mother was able to bake bread until the famine ended. She and her son never went hungry. David had heard the Bible story in Sabbath school. The Sabbath school teacher had told the children, you need to share with those who are hungry. David broke the last of his bread in half. Here you are, he told the hungry boy. David and the three boys nibbled on the delicious, chewy bread. It was a good breakfast. David felt good that he had been able to help the other boys. His own breakfast wasn't big, but he didn't get hungry before kindergarten ended and he went home for lunch. The next day, the same thing happened again. When David pulled out his bread for breakfast, other boys asked him to share. David shared again, and again he felt good. After that, children asked David to share his breakfast every day. Many things changed when David finished kindergarten and started first grade. School started at 11 o'clock, so he ate breakfast at home. But now he ate lunch at school. Mother no longer packed bread for him. Instead, she gave him lunch money to buy bread to eat. But one thing didn't change. Children kept asking David to share his food, and he kept sharing. Today, David is 13 years old, and he has shared his food for eight years. His kindness has surprised some classmates, and they ask, why are you sharing? David likes to tell them the story of how Jesus shared food with a crowd of 5,000. Or he tells the story of how Jesus shared food with a crowd of 4,000. Or he says that Jesus shared everything with his disciples. I want to share like Jesus, David says. David's generosity has had a good influence on his classmates. When they saw him share his food, they also started sharing their food with those who had none. David says he is happy that he can share. Sometimes I feel hungry because I give away so much food, he says. But I'm happy because I can follow Jesus' example of sharing. I believe that I'm sharing the light of Jesus with my friends. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a Seventh-day Adventist school in David's home country of Cameroon, where children will be able to learn about the joy of sharing God's blessings with others. Thank you for planning a generous offering.
Power Pointers, and welcome back to another episode of PowerPoint Sabbath School with Friends. This week's lesson is Lesson 3, and the title is Wisdom Rules. Our power text is taken from Galatians 5, verse 13, and it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. Our PowerPoint is God's love leads us to serve others fairly. Before we go on further, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you for the Sabbath that you've created. And we thank you for the blessings upon blessings that you have given unto us. Father, we thank you for our friends and our family. And we thank you for the PowerPoints who are watching at this moment. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Now uh, for our Bible lesson at a glance. The prologue to Proverbs tells its purpose and theme, which is partially reflected in this week's power text. The audience that Proverbs has written was written for is mainly young people. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Proverbs 1 verse 8. The book contains warnings and commands. It reveals the rewards of, follow, of following its instructions and the consequences of ignoring them. Wisdom, knowledge, discipline all begin with a reverence for the Lord. The result is a practical life of service. This is a lesson about service. God's word is clear about the ways in which we can serve. On the program today is my beautiful co-hostess, Marcia Vianami and Nathaniel Adderley. Unfortunately, Joshua was not able to make it with us this week, but hopefully he will next week. So our first question for today is, why do you think Solomon tested the two mothers in the way that he did? Once again, why do you think Solomon tested the two mothers in the way that he did? Go ahead, Nathan. He wanted to. He wanted to think. Uh, I mean, he wanted to find out who was genuine or not. He wanted to find out if this. Oh, the, oh, this this mother is a real mother. Is, oh, but she loves a child. But both of them were pretty convincing. So that means he had to do the ultimate test. He took a sword. I was going to kill him. The the real mother would show real concern. The fake mother was like, "Yeah, fine, do your worst." It shows how. It shows them that just one simple action can really show who you really are. Yes, I agree with Nathaniel. It showed who was more genuine. And like they said, there's no love like a mother's love. And to be honest, I was actually very smart because the real, the actual mother, she would rather give, give up her son to another person that's not his mother or her mother. Uh, the stress life of the woman, she just bluntly said, okay, Al, you have half and I have half. But that's really smart of Solomon. I agree with both of you. I think the way that Solomon um, tested the two mothers was really um, like next level intelligent and wisdom for real. And um, it's also shown how who oh yeah the main reason was literally to find out who the real mother was but it was to test how genuine they were and how genuine the real mother could have possibly been because no mother in there right like marcia said a mother's love is a different kind of love there's no way that a mother is going to allow her child to be killed than rather than to give it to somebody else who will take care of him as well so like if you are able to give your child, if you have no other option but for your child to be killed or for your child to live and live with somebody who is not their mother, yet you still know that that child will still be taken care of, then it's it's a it's not a win win situation. It's either you lose or you win, and the winning point or the area is having your child with somebody else because you know that child is still living. So I feel like it was a test to test. It was really to test how genuine the mothers could be, and also to check who was the real mother because no mother would want her child to be chopped in two. And that was really outrageous 
to see that the other mother was really like, oh, if you can't have him, I can't have him. That's like surreal. So that's how he knew that was not her child. Because if you were a mother, you would never want your child to be killed. Especially not the child that you carried for nine months. Obviously, you didn't because you want him to be dead. Uh, um, so now moving on to our second question. Why do you think the real mother was willing to give up her baby? Why do you think the real mother was willing to give up her baby? I think the mother was willing to give up her baby because, like, think about it. If, if like, if you want the baby, it's going to be dead, but... Or, wait, wait, no. Uh, let me explain it another way. Let's say at least the child is living. He's, she's not with you, but at least she knows that the baby's not dead. And she doesn't want the baby to be dead. She, of course, she's the genuine mother. She would not just allow her child to die, or like, in a way, if she wants the baby, the baby's gonna die, so... It's better than the alternative. Because she wants her baby to live. She loves her baby. That's a genuine mother right there. But she has to give it up to someone who she knows will take care of him, even though it's not really her. So it's either let the baby die or let the baby live with another mother. She decides, even though she's not going to be the mother, all that matters is, is the baby going to be alive? She wants the baby to be alive. So that's all that matters. Yes, I totally agree. She didn't want her child to die. And like you said, Kizia, that is the child that she cared for nine months. And then, oh, get to imagine the hurt that she felt when she found the a, lie, a baby dead on the side of her, even though it wasn't her baby. But like Nathaniel was saying, yes, yeah, she would rather the child be alive than um, die. I'm dead. And it's really out of spite. It's really out of spite the woman did that. The other woman did that. That she would rather kill the other person, baby, have it cut in half just because her child was dying. I mean, grief, I don't know how, I think it can go be expressed beyond measure. But wow, that was really, really far. But yes, the mother, she didn't want her baby to die, even if. If she, um, the baby had to be alive and living with someone. I absolutely agree with both of you. And it's a bit redundant, but the same thing, like I said, the mother wanted to see her child live. And when you think about it, even if she... She knew it's not, it wasn't her child, and the other my other person knew it was not her child either. So I felt like maybe eventually that other person would come around and say, hey, you know, like, this was wrong. Maybe if she had a heart. I don't know. She seems like she didn't. And also, uh, I think that if the child is alive, you can obviously see the child around. Um, You can always visit the child, stuff like that. So you were able to have a child that's living. But to have a child that's dead, there's nothing you can do with that. And then again, like I said, the nine months that you've spent carrying a child, for the child just to be dead over a silly little petty argument, then that would just be so, that would be really useless. Like, it would not, it'd be a waste of time and energy. It's just crazy. But our third question is, in what ways did Solomon prove that he was a why, that he had a wise and discerning heart. Once again, in what ways do you think Solomon pro proved that he had a wise and discerning heart? I'd like to say how he was smart. Like he knew that the real mother would happen to her reaction when the baby was about to be sliced in half, basically. And showed how he's smart, knowing, oh, the real mother's reaction is going to be sad, and the fake mother's reaction is going to be careless. It shows that King Solomon really didn't know what he was doing as king. It really was the right thing. It really was when God told him you could have anything you want in the world, and Solomon showed wisdom. That really was the best thing that he could ever ask for. 
I believe what showed that Solomon had a wise and discerning heart was because he recognized his responsibility as king. I think you could see his worry when he said, Oh, I'm about a child I am about a child. I don't know how to come or go. And because he recognized his um his responsibility as king, he knew that his actions it can influence not only his children or his subjects or the people the nation that he rules over. So if he wanna be a good example or a good and righteous ruler, he needs guidance from God. And oh yeah, to further my point in that he needed God's help, he instead of asking for um his enemy's head or for riches, he knew that in order I mean I feel this is yes, further my point on recognizing his responsibility, but he knew that in order for him to fulfill this world, I mean, this his role, he just, he needed God's guidance and his help and his discernment of wisdom. Agreed. And you can see in so many different stories where Solomon had a discerning heart and a, and a, a wise spirit. Um, where even in the book of Proverbs alone is proof that he was wise because many things that we as young people in the 21st century are going through are still problems that he addresses in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and even some in Songs of Solomon. So um, I think that you, in, in then in the story is a prime example. I remember when I, the first time I watched the story, I think it was on like a Bible show and it spoke to me because I was like, he was, I think he was really young at this age. He was probably like 20 something. He was pretty young. And he was able to discern and see who the real mother was. And it wasn't like he just automatically got it. But God gave him this idea and this wisdom to say, hey, you know, let's try. Say we're going to chop this baby. And maybe they will come through and you will eventually see who is the real mother? And you know, person, you can see in the story where the the attendants around him like were shocked. They didn't know who could have possibly been the mother, but he just instantly thought of this idea, and he was able to save a child's life. Because then again, if a child ended up with the wrong mother, you don't know how that child could have been mistreated. All kinds of things could have happened. So his discerning heart. Um, brought way for a child to have a better life and for a mother to actually have her child again. Um, go ahead, Marcia. Oh, sorry. I just want to add, like, to further my point last time. And to think about this logically, if he asks for the head of his enemies, most likely it would be for um kings or subjects from another country or from a tribe because you know back then they were divided by tribes and that could influence the country in a way that everybody would be in turmoil and it would cause trauma because war it really isn't something nice it isn't really it's not something pleasant at all and if he just asked for riches then that would lead to greed i mean they see that he um, did gain those things in the end, but if he just straight out act, um, acts for those things, to show where his heart is and that he didn't really, he wasn't really ready for the world. Yeah, he wasn't really ready as his response. I agree. So those are the ways that I see and, you know, the Bible says you would know them by their fruits. And mainly that's talking about false prophets. But I think anything in general or anyone, you would know them by their fruits. And because he was so, um, he was able to just articulate his words so well and make such sharp decisions so quickly, I think that really shows that he is able to. And also that's a, that's a a way that we can know that he really listened to God because you have some persons who but God is speaking to them and they're just not they're not listening or they're just simply not wanting to follow what he has to say and you realize that 
Solomon had that ability to understand what God had to say, listen, and then follow through. So I think that's also a very important lesson we can learn as young people. And that is to try to hear what God has to say and whether it be he, him actually speaking to you or just a simple verse that you really needed to hear that day or just somebody saying something to you that, you know, they probably didn't know what you're going through, but they're here, they're, they're um, just telling you. So you listening um through others and the word of God can really give you that discerning spirit, I would say, or that wisdom, because sometimes you really just need it. And lastly, our last question is, when have you ever acted unfairly to someone else? What could you have done differently? What can you do now to make things right with the person whom you have treated unfairly? I'll repeat that again because it's a pretty big question. When have you acted unfairly to someone else? And what could you have done differently? What can you do now to make things right with the person whom you have un you've treated unfairly? I'll go. Um, this question is really ironic to me because something just happened yesterday between me and my brother Max. Um, I was asking him to do something to me. I mean, do something for me. And all this time I was saying the wrong thing. And he was asking me, Oh, you mean you want me to do this? Like for example, I wanted him to wash a shirt for me but it had a, like a specific brand name but i was calling it the other brand name and i totally i was ignorant of the fact and he was asking me um yeah, do you want it to be this one i was like of no of course i wanted to be like that like i was being as sarcastic but he said you know what since you won't want to explain to me probably i'm gonna do it and then when i, I said max her go do it and then when he eventually did it and I saw it, and I was like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, Max. I was actually calling the wrong name brand. It was actually, it was actually, I was calling the name Old Navy, and it was actually um French Toast. I was like, oh, oh, Max, sorry, sorry. But that really just reiterates the fact that I really need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And to be honest, I really, I was just round him yesterday because sometimes my brother can be a bit passive. So I thought he was being sarcastic with me, but still I should have been patient and still went over to see because I actually was in the wrong scene, the wrong brand of the shirt. But now I know that I just need to be patient, cool down, be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anchor. Or the time I treated someone unfairly. All right, all right, all right. Hear me out. There was this dog. I had this little cousin. Like my little cousin, AJ. Well, for some reason, I just wasn't having a good day. And so, I said, you see that dog, you see that dog over there? I want you to go pet it. I'm sorry. I know, I know, I know. It just was not having a good day. And I could not tolerate. I, I just could not tolerate anything. I just wanted to have like a good little laugh. Seeing the thing is, the dogs are chasing him. It was like, help me, help me. I eventually helped him, but I still feel bad for that this day. And I kind of made up for it. I kind of made up for it. I paid him $10 the next week. Right? I paid him a, a good 10 bucks, right? That's what they compensate for it. And yeah, we're still very close. He still hasn't forgotten about that. Sometimes when I'm not looking, he, he, barfs, he barks at me. Like, bark, bark, as if the dog's right behind me. But yeah, I feel really bad for doing that to him. But at the same time, it was kind of funny. And I gave him $10 back, so yeah. Oh, there were some stories. But I... Mm -mm. a time I treated someone unfairly well I know there was this incident well recently but it wasn't like I did anything and like I didn't fix it so I did fix it so 
basically there was something that was given to me and I it was the name was on it and I knew it was not mine right and I kept quiet it was my friend zone and I kept quiet because she wasn't complaining I know she had mine and I heard hers and they mix up the the items and I didn't say anything because I liked hers more than mine and I kept quiet and I didn't say anything and I was like hmm if she's not complaining about hers I'm not gonna complain about mine because then that means she likes hers and I like mine so I'm not gonna say anything about it I'm not gonna have a switch back and I was like hmm you know yeah and over the weekend I had it and then Monday she started to complain about how she didn't like it anymore and how it didn't feel like it was hers because we saw it earlier and she's like it does she doesn't recognize it it didn't look like hers and I was like mm, maybe you don't recognize it because it's not really yours that I wasn't gonna say anything but then I started to feel bad because I'm like you know this is her things and I have them and knowingly I have them but it's like, and so I felt in a way that my conscience would not let me go down having her stuff. And she's upset that she doesn't have her things. And I'm acting like, I don't know that I have her stuff. So I ended up giving her back her things. Not, and I don't know where I'm like, because she's like, oh, you know, if you have mine, then that's okay. That's okay. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not okay. It's not fine. Um, we mixed up our items. So um, it, the, it would only be right if I give you mine. And so basically it was our best for our prefect uniform. And it was tailored to our um, measurements. And so mine was like, hers was like fitted on me. So it looked really good. And mine was a little bit more baggy on her. And so it looked worse on her than it did on me. So I felt like it would have been very selfish for me to keep her vest, thinking I, oh my gosh, I feel good in it. And knowing that she does not feel her absolute best in it because it's really not hers. So I ended up giving her back her vest. And so now I have mine and I had to learn how to be satisfied um, with mine. So that's basic. It wasn't like unfairly. It wasn't like I treated her unfairly in a way. It was just I kind of like kept quite. It was a deceptive thing that I did. I would say that. Yeah. But um. I I gave her back her vest, so now my conscience is completely cleared and I'm guilt-free. Go ahead, Marcia. Yes, I can feel, I can surely say that it was the Holy Spirit convicting you. But I just want to, I just want to say something because it just popped up in my mind. Uh, and we were, this last week we were discussing, um, Proverbs 22, and one of the verses, verse 4, was by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And I was just thinking, I was like, oh my goodness, this is just a prime example of how God was brought, um, God was brought to glory. I don't know if that sounds right. But anyway, God was glorified. And also we can see that Solomon was honored in a way. Because you know, in the same, it's in the same chapter, First Kings, chapter three, but I think it's like different segments. But anyway, in the first part of chapter three, we see that you know talking about how old Solomon was, and that when God asked him what he wanted from him, and um, Solomon told him that he wanted wisdom, and then after that. That's the story of the two women, and from by Solomon's humility and ask, not asking for riches or the life of his enemy, Rachel and God. I am surrendering whatever. I'm surrendering any everything to you. I'm surrendering myself to you. Whatever will you have for me, I'll ask for wisdom so I can be of service to you. And then, bam, that's the story of the two. Um, the two women and how they were fighting over a child. And it just so it brought to light God's wisdom and how because of the gift that God um, gave Solomon, he was also brought to glory. And Solomon also, um, he became honorable in the sight of everybody because everybody, they 
saw that, they saw the situation with the two women and they were amazed. So I really look back on that verse. I was like, yes, it's really true by humility and the fear of the Lord, riches and honor and strength. And we know that later on, Solomon, I would say he was rich and wealthy. And also, I think he lived about 900 years. So that was wow. So I was just thought about that and it just blew me away. But I'll turn it back over to you, Casey. That's all right. I love that input. Thank you all so much. That is all the questions for today. And I think you guys did an amazing job answering them. And I think that this lesson really shows us how personally, firstly, how selfish persons can be. Because when you literally take someone's child and you say that it's yours, that's a different level of just being covetous in a way. And um, that's actually kind of similar to the story that I told, but I didn't I didn't go through with it. Yeah, that was the Holy Spirit. But um Thank you, Nathaniel and, and Marcia. Oh, sorry, I was talking about how the lesson we can learn from that. And that's firstly how persons can be selfish. And also how Solomon was at such a young age, so discerning and so wise. And the only way he could have gotten that was through God. And so I admonish the young people who are watching, ask God for wisdom. Like, I feel like he will give you the desires of your heart. He will. And once you have faith that he will, I feel like he will. So just pray about it. It doesn't even hurt to try. So go ahead, Messia. Sorry, I know I intervened a lot. But like you said, how Solomon was young, that just shows us also that we are never too young for anything. And I even think in, in one of the books of Timothy, Paul told Timothy that he wasn't too young for ministry. So just how God used I mean, to us, because we are 15, 16, and I think the time is 13, that I would have been like, oh, he's way older than us. But 20 is young, too. We are never too young to do things, and he started to do a good work for the Lord through his wisdom. So that was wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Marcia. So closing, in closing, PowerPoint, is that's the lesson of the day. Stay prayed up. And ask God for wisdom because he will give you the desire of your heart. Um, now, as we close, I would just like to say PowerPoint is to not go anywhere because we have a few things coming up next. We have Pastor DJ with our 28 greats. And we also have a new segment, and that's Auntie Ida May with our nutritional facts. So stay tuned for that as well. And also, please stay tuned for our special feature, which will be about God's animals. We're doing a little series on God's animals. And I think last week, I think, was a dolphin. I'm not too sure. But I think last week, no, I think last week was a honeybee. Yes, last week was a honeybee. And so I'm excited to see what next week will be. And that is all. Oh, we also like to say thank you to Uncle PJ. He's finally back with that great amount of excitement in the beginning of the program. So thank you so much, Uncle PJ, and to Pastor DJ, who is coming up next. And that is all. Oh, my gosh. I keep on forgetting to say this. Please subscribe to the channel, everyone. Please, if you, not, if you have not already, please subscribe to the channel. Currently, we have 1.56K subscribers. So thank you so much. Every week it's going up, it's going up. So please, if you are not subscribed, please subscribe. I don't know what you're doing. Just watching and not clicking subscribe, you really need to. So please subscribe if you have not already and share with friends, share, 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 not just to get views, but to also spread the word of God throughout all the world we're trying to get to that goal uh that is all but before we close can uh, marcia please pray for us today all heads bowed all heads closed and most gracious father i ask that you impress upon the listener's heart to come to you and to also seek your wisdom lord can you please be with us and can you please guide us throughout our life's endeavors. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Amen. Thank you so much, my dear, for that prayer. Once again, thank you, Nathaniel, and thank you, Mar thank you, Nathaniel, for joining my and I on the program today. And unfortunately, Joshua was not with us this week, but he will be back hopefully next week. Then, when again, once again, PowerPointers, we want to tell you a happy Sabbath, and we hope you guys have an amazing rest, amazing next week, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Do you want to live at peace? Trust in the Lord. Hello, my PowerPoint. This is Pastor DJ with what we believe. Phenomenal belief number five speaks of God's the Holy Spirit. We believe as Seventh day Adventists that the Holy Spirit is God, which means He's everywhere. He's all powerful and he's all knowing. My God. We also believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through that still small voice. We hear the Holy Spirit in our thought. And so when we feel afraid, when our hearts are broken, Guess what? The Holy Spirit of God is here to tell us that everything is going to be all right. And even right now, I don't know what you are going through, but the Holy Spirit of God is here and he's speaking to you saying, everything is going to be all right. He teaches us right from wrong he teaches us to be obedient to god and so my point is be obedient to the voice of god may god bless you and have a happy sabbath this is pastor dj just brushed and flossed your teeth, your mouth feels oh so great and clean. However, the truth is that you have a mouth full of bacteria. Bacterial plaque is constantly forming on your teeth and gum tissues. Bacterial plaque especially likes to get into the gum pockets or collar of the gum tissues surround forming on your teeth and gum tissues. Bacterial plaque especially likes to get into the gum pockets or collar of the gum tissues surrounding the teeth. And these are the places most frequently missed. This can lead to periodontal disease. And the reason we all need to visit our dental hygienist to get our teeth clean. Just as people need to eat to stay alive, so does the bacteria. It feeds on the sugar that are found in the food we eat. The more sugar, the more bacteria, the more plaque, the more acid, and the more dental disease. Almost always when talking to children about dental health, all hands are raised to quit eating sugar to protect their teeth. Unfortunately, when they are asked if they are willing to stop eating candy bars, cookies, chewing gum, and soft drinks, the hands slowly go down. They do not realize that all these goodies that they love so much contain large amounts of sugar. Adults are also shocked at the amount of hidden sugar in many of the foods that they consume. They drink orange juice instead of an orange or a sticky fruit roll up instead of delicious strawberries. Many dentists see many small children with their two front teeth eaten away from the nursing bottle syndrome. Because children go to sleep with a bottle of milk in their mouth, sugar from the milk coats their teeth and causes tooth decay. 
From all of this, we can tell that in spite of the fact that we brush our teeth and floss regularly and use mouthwash, there are some bacteria we cannot see and reach. We need the help of our dentists and dental hygienists. It is the same with our spiritual life. We cannot purify ourselves. We need God's cleansing and covering to make us whole from the plaque of sin. If you need to visit your dentist, make that appointment today. Your spiritual dentist is always waiting for you to call. Make sure you make that call today. This is Ida May Hanley, your dietitian, challenging you to take charge of your This is an eagle. Eagles are strong birds with big wings, sharp yellow beaks, and white feathers on their heads. Eagles live in nests like most birds, but their nests aren't in the trees. Eagles make their nests way up high in the mountains, and they use sticks, plants, seaweed, and even thorns to make them. Eagles have big wings that help them fly really fast and they have sharp beaks that help them eat their food easier. Eagles also have really powerful eyes that help them see things that are really far away. This helps them find food for their dinner. Not only can eagles see very well, but they're also very faithful too. Most animals leave their family when they are very young, but eagles stay with their families for their whole lives. Even if the mommy or daddy eagles have to fly away for a couple days, they show faithfulness and always come back to take care of their families. God is always faithful to us and wants us to be faithful to each other too.